Hello, everyone. I'm Kent, and I'm here to uh, share with you some insights about uh, securing IoT uh, and device on board using the Puff-based uh, device identity solution. Okay, uh, let me quickly introduce myself and my company. So uh, my company, Puff Security, is uh, dedicated working on integrated security IPs. Uh, and of course, based on our name, uh, most of these uh, are Puff-based uh, solutions. And I'm Kent, I'm the Puff technology expert in our IMD team, and I've been working on Puff for quite many years. So I'm here to share the latest uh, research results uh, on Puff and what are their uh, applications. So before uh, starting to, to Puff-based solutions, I would like to briefly talk about some uh, typical IoT security considerations. And for IoT, uh, we typically can briefly divide it into uh, three different layers. And as you see, there are endpoint devices, uh, which uh, we care mostly about the data confidentiality of uh, the data stored in these devices. And we also want to make sure these uh, devices are running with uh, a secure firmware and software. And also we don't want a counterfeit device to enter our ecosystem. And move on to the connectivity layers. Uh, it's simple that we want to make sure that uh, all the communications between network entities uh, is secure. And also we want to make sure the, the devices are controlled and updated uh, remotely and securely. And up to the cloud layers, uh, we typically want to uh, prevent uh, malicious access to the uh, services or the databases. And recently, because number of devices has increased uh, rapidly, so it's getting more important to have the devices to be on board uh, securely and efficiently. So it brings up the, the zero touch uh, device on board uh, requirement. And as you see, there are a lot of different security considerations. And of course, there are different solutions. And for these solutions, uh, there are different requirements, but I think there's one key requirement, which is uh, the devices need to be uh, securely uh, identified. So let me give you an example on how a device identification works in a real case. So for device identification, uh, this example is the, using the latest uh, FIDO uh, device on board uh, spec. And in this spec, uh, the, the owner of the device would get an ownership voucher from the supply chain and which contains a part and the device's identity. And the owner would later on knows the, the identity of the device in which is uh, kind of a public key of this device. And also the rendezvous server in the middle would also know the, the device's uh, identity. But what they do not know is the, the device that they are communicating is they do not know exactly if this uh, device they are communicating has the, is the legitimate owner of that uh, device identity. So what is required is that this device during these uh, protocols, the transfer ownership one and transfer ownership two protocols, there is a step that this device need to uh, sign uh, a challenge and then send back the, the signature to the rendezvous server and the owner to prove itself is the legitimate owner of that uh, identity. And that is done by signing the message using its own device acquisition key, which is kept in the restricted operating environment of this device. So it can generate a signature to prove this IoT device is exactly the device uh, the, the owner and the server wants to communicate with. So after showing that examples, we know there we need a de device acquisition key to be stored in the device. And the next question is, how should it key be? Uh, how, what's the quality of this key and how do we store this key? So basically for this key, we want to, it to be unpredictable. So it, you cannot guess it out of nothing or you cannot find uh, any similarity with other keys that you already know. And so in that case, uh, in summary, it needs to be unique. And how can it be unique? In the common practice, these keys need to be securely uh, provisioned into the device. And the next question is how to make ensure this key cannot get stolen? Because if the key gets stolen, no matter how good your key is, there's no security. So 
it means that this key should be securely kept somewhere and typically it should be kept in a hardware a root of trust. So what a root of trust is, I will show you in the next slide. Uh, here it shows a, a brief uh, example of how a root of trust uh, is placed in a system. And basically it is used to store and manage the most uh, sensitive uh, digital assets that was needed in this system. So about root of trust, I would like to give uh, a few more words about it and to position ourselves, uh, what's our solution that we offer. And so to do that, I would like to give an example of the Open Titan Root of Trust. And as shown in the left-hand side figure, it shows that the, the Root of Trust solutions uh, consists of designs from many different abstract layers. And the amount of that you can see there, there, there are quite a lot of uh, design efforts to do to, to build up a Root of Trust. And what Open Titan aims for is to uh, make these root of trust solutions as open sourced as possible. But it is, uh, there, there is a problem because the, the analog IPs and the, and, and the foundry IPs, for example, the, the, the embedded memory blocks, they are really difficult to be uh, really open sourced because you need to uh, fine tune the designs and also in a design stage and also sometimes after the, 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 after it's been manufactured as well. So it makes it really difficult to have a open sourced design of these blocks uh, that suits, is suitable for the general public. So that's what we want to offer. We want to offer a solution that is easy to use. Uh, so that's why we combine the digital design and these foundry and analog IPs to make it an integrated solution. Uh, that we combine the software ma and hard macro into a, a total solution that can be easily placed in your system. And by the way, if you're interested on Open Titan, uh, there is uh, it is actually introduced uh, in the last year's Authenticate conference. So if you you can check the recording if you like. And now I want to move on to the uh, Puff-based device ID solution that we offer. It uh, shows the left hand in the right hand figure. So. This total solution that we offer, it consists of a root of trust hardware part, which has the, some hardware primitive, the path, uh, the true random generator, and the one that programmable memory, a secure storage. And also it's important that these blocks are surrounded by uh, some anti-tempering designs to make them more resilient to different types of attacks. And also uh, we have a crypto engine placed beside this root of trust block to provides uh, most of the standard uh, cryptographic algorithms. And it also manages the, the sensitive assets stored in the root of trust block and to make uh, the users and uh, the system do not have to worry about how to manage these uh, digital assets, which makes this solution more secure and more easy to use. So after showing that what our root of trust solution is, it's important that we have a puff block in our design. So what a puff is, uh, puff is actually, uh, you can consider it as an inborn hardware fingerprint and puff stands for a physically unclonable function. And basically it has the following properties is need to be physically unclonable and unique and reliable and also provides physical uh, security. And having all these properties, it can become the one and the only one identity for your chip. Making it, you cannot clone it, and you, the, the ID is inborn with the device, so it won't be blank. So you always have an ID, and it cannot be cloned. So it's very good for security. And how to use it, I will show you in the next example. So we already know that we need a different type of keys to perform secure uh, operations. So for PATH, we can we use it to generate these key pairs. And in this example, we have a path uh, hardware which can generate some uh, secret data. And this secret data can be fed into a cryptographic engine and in combined with some optional auxiliary info. And then we can derive the key pair that we need for uh, device identification. And in this key pair, uh, the public key is typically sent out for registration uh, to be part of the device uh, ID. And the private key is retained always inside the chip that is always only used for to sign messages while doing a device authentication. So it is important 
that this, this private key never leaves the chip. So we can make sure this uh, private key is only owned by this particular device. So no, no other party else. So it can always use this private key to securely prove its identity. So next, uh, I want to show that why we want to use PUFF in practice because it actually provides a more secure and more cost-efficient uh, solution. So comparing with uh, uh, conventional examples, so the most common way of uh, having keys into our devices is to inject them into our SOC while manufacturing. So in this example, uh, we need a dedicated uh, equipment and a setup to program the key into the SOC chips. Uh, so this process, we need to build up this all this setup, which is costly. And also maybe you have to buy uh, some, you need to pay for some service from the third party. So all this process would be quite costly. And also we typically spend a lot of efforts on making sure that this procedure is done securely, but there's always a tiny chance that this key still gets stolen or leaked through this process. So it's, there will be some security concerns. And the next example that's can be, that is done some in some uh, real products is that they, you can use uh, the, uh, a discrete uh, secure element chip to generate the key and store the key uh, for your system chip. Uh, but you can obviously see that because you need an additional component, additional uh, secure element to do that. So you, it's also add a, uh, some cost to your uh, device. So it brings out that uh, the, our Puff solution is the, the most secure and and cost efficient way of having keys into your devices because of these keys are, are actually inborn. So you don't need to inject them into your device and because it's generated by uh, the chip itself. So you don't need an additional uh, component. So making it secure and cost efficient. So after showing all the examples of how PATH can benefit uh, your device and let's take a look how a PATH is actually implemented. So here shows example of a path based on quantum tunneling, which has a bit cell as the left-hand side figure, which has actually two transistors placed in parallel. And while using this path, we apply a high voltage stress across uh, the gate oxide of these two transistors. And afterwards, 50% uh, of this bit cell would have a, a we call the quantum tunneling path, quantum tunneling path uh, at the left side or either at the right side with both 50% chance. So in this case, we can define a cell with a tunneling path at the left side to be one and the, the cell with a tunneling path at the right to be zero. And if we've placed a lot of bit cells in our chip, uh, we have a path array and we can generate a, a nicely a secret a random data pattern that can be used further on to derive the keys. And what is important of this uh, quantum tunneling path is that it actually reached the state of art robustness, which is better than all the existing paths because it reaches 100% stability with zero bit error rate. And it's also insensitive to environment and there's no aging effects. And it's important that also it reaches ideal randomness and uniqueness and also by achieving all these uh, state-of-the-art performance, it doesn't require any additional processing steps and it doesn't require any additional uh, helper data algorithms. So it's how the, the state of, reaches actually the state-of-the-art performance. Okay, let me continue with uh, next property of the path is actually it's resilient to uh, reverse engineering. So let's consider a conventional key storage. For example, you use an eFuse to program your keys. And in this case, you can see that from this scanning electron microscope image, uh, you can easily see that uh, an unprogrammed a zero cell would have a short, the metal line is not broken, but in the other case, the programmed one, the fuse the cell has a, a clear open circuit in the cell that you can visually see it. So you can distinguish uh, the secret data stored in the the e-fuse by just visually inspecting it. But in another case, the, the key generated by PATH uh, technology, you can see that uh, 
using the same technique, the, the, the scanning electron microscope uh, technique, uh, you cannot see any difference between the unprogrammed cell or the programmed cell. So that's uh, the main difference. So you can, it doesn't reveal any information while you store uh, your keys into uh, these uh, paths. So after we know that we have a path in place in our chip, and then we can also go back to the, 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 F the FDO uh, example, so now we have a device EID embedded in our chip, so we can use it to derive the device identification key that is need for this uh, protocol. So again, we can register the public key and include it in the ownership voucher, and we can use this path-based device decision key to sign the message that we receive from the owner and the the view server, so we can support the, this protocol pretty well. Okay, uh, so after illustrating the role of the in FDO, uh, let's have a glance at the entire I uh, IoT ecosystem. So here we roughly divide it into uh, four different sections. So first is the supply chain. So once a chip is manufactured, we want it to have already an inborn ID inside this chip. So it can be used to support uh, different supply chain security applications uh, to against the adversarial uh, supply chain activities. For example, uh, counterfeiting and overproduction. And later on, we already know that it can support the zero touch device on board. And then afterwards, it can be um, securely on board into the cloud. And in the cloud, because we already have these inborn keys in our devices, so they can help to manage the, the IoT uh, security system. And so it can make this IoT network more secure. And afterwards, so once the devices uh, need, to need to be decommissioned, so we also support the security by while this the chip is being disassembled, disassembled from the, the device, we can uh, issue a device EID zero validation command and it will destroy all the secrets that's uh, stored in uh, this chip. So there's no risk of the, the sensitive uh, digital assets being revealed after the chip is uh, disassembled. Okay, uh, so now let me give you some examples on how a path can support uh, supply chain uh, security. So first is to defense against counterfeiting. So at the left hand example, we have the chip counterfeiting issues. So you have your original chip designs, then the attacker can reverse engineering your chip and try to re reproduce another chip, which has the, exactly the same function as your original one. And let's assume that now you have the device EID embedded in your chip and a device uh, because it's resilient to reverse engineering technique. So the attacker would not be able to reproduce exactly the same chip uh, anymore. So basically if the, the counterfeit chip does not have the, the, the device EID, uh, it cannot be used or it can be correctly identified and you can uh, remove it from your ecosystem. So it can basically helps to prevent uh, counterfeit chips. And the next example is about uh, counterfeit devices. So assume you have uh, by uh, off-the-shelf components and assemble it as your own device, and you spend the effort to build up the firmware to power this device. And an attacker can try to uh, get all these components and assemble the same device and try to steal your firmware and put it into their, their devices and to make it work. And how to solve it is that you can, now you have a, a device EID in your chip, and then you can use it to encrypt the firmware. And then when you need it, you can decrypt it again. And in this case, if, the, if an attacker gets exactly the same device and they try to program the, the firmware, which is encrypted into the, the, their device, because the, the chip, they will not have the same key as yours. So they cannot decrypt the, the data. So it will, the counterfeit device will basically not work. So in this case, the firmware encryption using device EID actually prevents uh, the counterfeit devices to enter the market. And the, the last example is the, the example of limiting our production. As a device maker, they can may request the chip maker to produce the chips that are customized for a particular set of devices. And the number of devices need to be controlled. Otherwise there may be overproduced chip that uh, flows into the market and that would that would harm the, the, the profits of the, the device makers. And how to solve this problem is that the main concept is to enforce an activation step before the chip can be found, become functional. 
So one can easily control the number of unactivated chips to prevent uh, overproduced chip from being powering others' uh, product. So how to do this? So we have a device EID in our chip, and then we, we enforce it to, to, so we have basically a chip fingerprint, and we would enforce an activation step, which is program an activation code, which is paired to this fingerprint to this chip. And the chip will check if the, if the activation code is uh, actually corresponding to this uh, fingerprint, and then it can decide if it will be activated or not. And so if an overproduced chip that is not gone through this chip activation process, it will not have been programmed with the right uh, activation code, so it cannot be uh, activated. And because the, the activation code and the fingerprint is uniquely paired, so even if you clone activation code from other chips, it will not correspond to the, the, the fingerprints that you have. So even if cloning uh, activation code will not make uh, the chip uh, usable. So we can solve the poor production issue using this device EID uh, solution. So after showing the last example, I would like to give a conclusion of this talk. So basically we have seen that device identification is essential for uh, IoT security. Uh, so the IoT device without a valid ID, they cannot be trusted. And also we know that the root of trust should be the secure foundation of this uh, IoT ecosystem because they need to store and protect the digital assets that's needed for IoT security. And we have seen that the quantum tunneling path is have a highly, is highly robust and highly secured, and it can support uh, the, the device EID solution, provides a nice uh, integrated solution. And we have seen that the, in some examples, the pub-based device EID solution can support the latest FIDO device on board spec and also supports many other uh, secured applications. So it basically uh, enables a more secure uh, IoT uh, ecosystem. So thank you for your attention and feel free to contact us if you have uh, any question and thank you and goodbye.